I'm not sure that I agree on the worldwide ghosting uh, looking like, especially not since I cut my hair and got new glasses. So, um, just to give you a bit of uh, geography, also for the foreign speakers here, I'm from, uh, I'm from Denmark, that's also a bit of my accent, and I'm up from this uh, northern part called Olbo, it's also called uh, Paris of the North, which might be a bit far-fetched, but um, Denmark is a nice place, so if you ever need to go somewhere to travel, come to Denmark because, as you know, in the period of 2013 to 2015, we were actually voted as the, the happiest country in the entire world. And if you only got one guess, the happiest city in Denmark, of course, uh, of course, all more. You know, we're very proud of that, so the whole tourist the industry really got together and said, now we really need to, uh, to brand Denmark and they made all these campaigns for attracting uh, clever people and showing all the good things about Denmark and uh, some of it went uh, on Facebook and then you also have these uh, comments <laughs> all good except the shitty weather <laughs> we have lots of rain and wind and uh, a bit of snow in the winter but uh, I think you from Cologne can also uh, not to that, not too different from uh, from here. So my way to into research, also to kind of show you and inspire you maybe, was that uh, you used to walk, work in this uh, store where we sold running shoes and we had to do all these fancy gizmo things to make sure that everybody got the Essex Cayano because they just had a slight bit of, of pronation that was the shoe to fix fix the pronation and we really started to discuss internally we were mostly officials, a couple of uh, sports people about them um, is this really the right way to do it, is this the truth, do we really need to spend 10 or 15 minutes looking at someone run with a mediocre camera from behind and say you need this shoe or you need uh, that shoe that was kind of what made me inquisitive and then I just started asking around the researchers in the local environment um, can I volunteer? Just give me some work. I just want to be exposed to uh, to what you do and what you learn. When you offer your your warm hands for free, you get heaps of opportunities of being involved in everything, basically. So, if you ever consider being involved in research, I think it's just a matter of, of asking the local people if there's anything you can actually help out with. Because based on the questions just before, some of you also have, I would guess, quite good questions. So we also get. Uh, input from, uh, from you guys. So, I work at the research unit for general practice, so most of the research that I do is about what do we do with the patients in general practice that come with musculoskeletal pains of somehow. And I had a research group called the Opti Youth, where we focus on musculoskeletal pain in, uh, in kids. So we're 12 people, seven are full-time at my research group, and we have five that are uh, 50% of the low report in the, in the research group and we span from GP to physiotherapist to health economist and, uh, and a clever guy who has an education in human-centered informatics that is kind of developing uh, apps to support the self-management of uh, patients with, uh, with pain. So what I really want to do, uh, to do today is talk about what is patellofemoral pain? What is this type of of knee pain to keep uh, hearing about. I want to talk about what do we actually do when the patients sit in front of us or the athletes with uh, anterior knee pain, patellofemoral pain. And now I want to focus on how do we apply this scientific knowledge to the patient in front of us. And of course, I really want to put science into practice so it's not about only showing the 10 latest RCTs but also how I would use this for the patient uh, in front of me in clinical practice. One thing I forgot to mention is that I still hold a 20% position at the physiotherapy department at the, the local hospital. So despite being a, a researcher and characterizing myself as a researcher, I still get a bit of, uh, of hands-on experience uh, once in a while, which I think is, is needed for us as, uh, as researchers. So if a patient came to you, could be an athlete, they drew on a, on a pain map, I either had pain here, or here, or something like this. What do you think the most likely uh, diagnosis would be for uh, each of these three pain presentations without knowing anything about the patient? 
You don't have to answer, but just to get your mind thinking about what are the three most common knee conditions we see in these sports active, uh, sports active people. And these were pain drawings from three patients. This one very, very diffuse anterior knee pain. This one was idiotibial band syndrome, runner's knee, lateral knee pain, very much characterized as pain on the lateral border of, of the knee. And over here we have a maybe even atypical presentation of uh, patellar tendinopathy where it's basically the tendon beneath the, beneath the kneecap causing pain. So that's the patient comes into your clinic with, with knee pain. These are at least three of the most common presentations. And besides, where does it hurt? Which is a often used question. There's other ways you can also uh, get an idea of how you differentiate between these three really, really common knee conditions. And especially pain localization, as I met, mentioned, but also how the pain presentation is. Because patellofemoral pain, it's this diffuse aching sensation around or below or beneath the kneecap, while both patellar tendinopathy and also idiotibial band syndrome, ITBS for short, is more a sharp and localized pain either at the patellar tendon or the lateral side of, of the knee. I'll have to share these slides uh, afterwards, so don't think about taking a photo of everything, but we can share it afterwards. And then if you, this would be for the, for the typical adult patient. And now if you go down to, to some of the younger athletes or younger patients, it's a bit different because the three most common types of, of knee pain would be patellofemoral pain again, but the growing pains and also uh, uh, slatter and this whole concept of where does it hurt is also something you can use to differentiate these three common conditions in, uh, in the young kids as well. Because of course that are very much localized pain on the tibial tuberosity down here, like on a, on a coin where you knock it, ah, that's exactly where it hurt. Well, if they have telofemoral pain, they would often say something, it's more diffuse aching sensation around my kneecap or behind my kneecap. So again, two, two quite different uh, presentations. So I have a patient or an athlete calling you say, ah, I have diffuse achy pain around or on the kneecap. The most likely knee condition is, uh, is patellofemoral pain. This is what we're going to, uh, to talk about today. And how is patellofemoral pain actually defined? Because um, if you look into the literature for the past 30 years, there's been a lot of different definitions of what, what is it. And I think it's changed. It's changed in the past years. A lot of things have changed in the past 30 years, but today we define it as pain at or around the patella in the absence of all these other common pathologies, in the absence of intraarticular pathology. It's not patella tendinopathy, it's not sitting last new Hansen. So it's when you rule out all these other common knee conditions, but you have a patient that experienced pain while loading on a bent knee or while running or walking on stairs. This is what you would characterize as, uh, as patellofemoral pain. So it's more a diagnosis of exclusion. And already here I'm alluding to that it's a very heterogeneous patient population. And most likely it's, a, it's an umbrella term that covers several different underlying conditions or pathologies, but we characterize it as, it as patellofemoral pain. Some might actually go so far and say it's it's not too different from, uh, from non-specific uh, low back pain, actually, which I, I agree on. And if you want to look, you know more about the bone terminology and the clinical examination side of things, go into uh, BGSM, and then uh, we make these consensus reports from these um, meetings we have every second year, the telephone research retreats where we publish these uh, consensus reports, and they're all published as uh, open access, so no, uh, no barriers for, uh, for accessing them if you're not in a university uh, institution. So, so from pain, is it a lonely bird or a, or a common fish? Just how common is this condition we're talking about today? We've done a couple of studies to estimate the prevalence in, in young people, 
below the age of 18. We found that the prevalence in these schools were around 6 to 7 percent, but of course in different uh, severities. That fits quite well with some data from the states as well, from, from Barbara Forrest, that also looked at these middle school uh, athletes where they found prevalence of, uh, of 7 percent. So, three different studies, each show that it's roughly one in every 14 kids that will at some stage suffer from uh, total femoral pain. So it's one of the more common uh, knee conditions in, uh, in this population. Then we have some data from, uh, from adults, where you have uh, some of the runners, how many runners develop total femoral pain while taking up a start to run program, maybe about 3-4%. Woodrow here was uh, university students going into PE education, bowling military recruits, and then you had this one from types of Belgian group where 34 or 33 percent developed uh, patellofemoral pain during these uh, six weeks of uh, basic military training. 43 percent developed an acute onset of patellofemoral pain while going into the military. Everyone now just been listening to to Gabbett already have an idea of, of where they would be on the acute to chronic uh, load ratio because the way they did it in Belgium in this stage was they had these underprepared young guys coming out of school and then wrapping up to between 10 and 15 hours of exercise within a matter of a week or two weeks so you can see that can kind of uh, ruin your uh, acute to chronic uh, workload ratio and, and I think that's one of the explanations of, of why 43% uh, actually develop an acute form of uh, total femoral pain during these only uh, six weeks. It's just to make the point that patellofemoral femoral pain is not about or only about biomechanics, how you move. The overarching fact and why you get patellofemoral femoral pain is just simply doing too much too soon, being unprepared for the load that you're exposed to. And all these small risk factors, you will hear people talking about how you move with your hip, how your foot moves. If you think of how much you do as, this is the risk factor for how much you actually do, then these other risk factors, biomechanical risk factors, biomechanical faults, some would call them, which is a very bad word to use, it's on this scale instead, so it's the training loads that are really, really important here as well, similar to what we heard just uh, previously. And a typical patient, someone like, uh, like Anna that I saw a few years ago, she's 17, she really, really enjoys uh, playing basketball, she just moved up to, um, to the first division, so now she starts to practice five times per week, and because it's, we're closing in on summertime, she also wants to get fit, for summer, that's why she starts to take up uh, gym sessions as well, and she also starts doing a bit more running in the spare time just to to be fit for summer. And then she develops patellar femoral pain. So when you talk to these young people, it's adults. You sit down, listen to their history. I would guess that in a lot of cases, you can also make them make this connection between a certain ramp up in training volumes and then the onset of their symptoms. And I think this is really, really important that we sit down and do this when we have patients with patellofemoral pain. Make them draw what did they actually do during the period where they developed, uh, developed knee pain. So one of the questions I often get is, uh, so patellofemoral pain, is that just some kind of a self-limiting condition? Is it just something that will uh, go away, just, just give it time? At least in Denmark, a lot of the, the GPs are often advised that we don't need to intervene, we don't need to do anything because in almost all cases this is a benign self-limiting condition similar to a lot of other musculoskeletal complaints. It'll go away, just give it time. So to kind of combat this question, we have uh, followed a cohort of uh, 504 kids now for five years. So they were between 15 and 19 when we started the cohort and now we just finished the five year follow-up when they're all between 20 and 25. So basically we had a group with uh, telephone pain in the beginning, up here, and then after two years, 65% still reported pain there, and now here after five years, it's basically one in, uh, in every two. And among those with other types of knee complaints, it's, it's only one of every three that have knee pain here after five years. So this common misconception about adolescent knee pain, 
telephenol pain being self-limiting, just it'll go away, just give it time. Doesn't really seem to, to hold true when it's investigated in a nicely population-based cohort study. And actually 15% of those actually said that their knee pain influenced their choice of job or career. An example would be the, the carpenter. He wants to be a carpenter, but when he started his education, he couldn't climb the stairs, so he was forced to actually change into a, an office job uh, instead. 40% said they either stopped or reduced their sports participation as a sole result of, of their knee pain. One third of those that still had knee pain at follow up actually um, regularly used their painkillers to, to self manage their knee pain. Most commonly, incest and paracetamols, and a few actually using morphine uh, like Olol and Morphine, but only like 5%. But still, I think it highlights the long term impact of knee pain and also that it impacts more than just pain. It actually also influences job, career, it influences how much sport, how physically active you are in the long run. So I think this is the point I'm trying to make that this is a common condition. It has some, some long term uh, impacts and there's a high degree of, of persistence and recurrence. That's why we need to be good at managing it. And I see this management as as different layers because you have the coaches when you're out with the athletes you're the one that will see the symptoms really really early on that's where you can use some of the things we'll be discussing today but also if you sit at a primary care unit or secondary care unit then you also have the obligations to to support these patients slash athletes in uh, in managing the telephone pain really really well because in the majority of cases this doesn't uh, go away, but if we seem to manage early on and help them manage workloads, for example, we might get uh, better long-term outcomes, I think. So, if we ask the question, how should I manage the patient in front of us, the normal uh, way forward would sometimes be to go to Cochrane and see what does uh, Cochrane advise, because that's kind of the, the highest level of, of evidence. They do well-conducted systematic reviews trying to to answer if A is better than B or what should we do with this condition. And if you go into the latest Cochrane review, they have an exercise for treating total pain. And it basically concludes that exercise is efficacious for treating total pain and it might be better to include both hip and knee exercises. So when I read this and I take my prior knowledge of all the underlying studies, I can see at least a thousand different ways on how to prescribe exercises for managing this condition. You could prescribe exercises in God knows how many ways. It could be twice per day, it could be once per week, it could be uh, leg extensions, it could be squats. So I don't think this really informs clinical practice because if we want to be informed, we also need to know what we need to know what we need to, to prescribe. I think that's a really, really important, uh, important point because this doesn't allow us to give any specific instructions to the individual patient in front of us. So I like Cochrane, they do an amazing job, but in terms of informing clinical practice, I don't think this is the only thing uh, forward. So also, like the whole concept of would you ever, just imagine if you saw an athlete or a patient with patellofemoral pain, would the only thing you would do prescribe exercises? Would you ever just say, here is an exercise sheet, you need to do these exercises extra work? That is not how clinical practice work. You would talk to the patient, you would advise them, you would educate them, and that exercise is just part of the package that we would uh, do with our, with our patients. So, so my approach, taking into account the cockpit, but also some of the things we've been doing in the past years, is to uh, to keep it simple for the majority. Don't overcomplicate it. It always comes back to the question of the patient in front of me. Why did she or he actually develop a total femoral pain? And of course, there's some that would develop a total femoral pain without being engaged in sport. But the majority of these patients with patellofemoral pain are often sports active people where I think the sports participation plays a major role in, in why they develop patellofemoral pain. 
So just, just think about it. If we have this underlying cause of too much tissue being underprepared, and the only thing we would prescribe to our patient is exercise, do we really change the underlying cause of why they got the total femoral pain? I hope you're shaking your heads because of course we wouldn't do that. A classical example could be that we prescribe you with hip and knee exercise, but you really continue to run 100 kilometers per week or whatever it, uh, it would be. And if you don't manage the load, build up again, it doesn't matter if we come up with any golden magic silver bullet, uh, bullet exercise. If we don't get this underlying cause fixed or changed, then I don't think it even matters what kind of exercise we, uh, we use. Because the way I use it with my, my patients, to also getting them to, to understand this concept, is I often print some of these uh, slides. I have five or six uh, slides that I print that I use for uh, when I see patients. And one of them is, is this simple idea that you do too much for what you're actually prepared for in terms of your capacity. And this capacity could be your genetics, how strong you are, and exercise is on its own. I try to sell it as that goes over here. It might increase your capacity to handle those. But if we don't change this left-hand side of the swing, uh, it's not called a swing. A seesaw, and learn a new word today. So don't change the left side of the seesaw. It doesn't really matter how much we try to increase the capacity. We need to bring some kind of a level uh, playing field between you know, these uh, these two. And I think the idea is that when we have patients, it's important not just to to give them knowledge; they need to understand it and also um, use it for changed behaviors uh, afterwards. And I find this printing of, uh, of PowerPoint uh, slides acts to be, a, to be a stimulus and then they can bring it back home and say, ah, this was actually what he, what he meant when we were talking about uh, managing how much I actually do and how do I get back to my, uh, to my previous level. And I think we have more and more evidence now, especially also from, from Gabbard's work that doing too much in going there too soon is a risk factor for developing these overuse injuries. We also have some cross-sectional data from both adults and kids that there's this U-shaped form between how much you do and your risk of having pain. So those that do a lot of sport are more likely to have musculoskeletal pain, but also those that do very, very little is also an increased risk of having pain at any given time. So these are cross-sectional prevalence data. Then we also have now data to suggest from, from these kids and also young adults with knee pain that if they continue, after developing knee pain, continue to be on this right-hand side, they're actually in risk of a poorer prognosis. I think it, it makes sense if they don't change the online course of what or why they got knee pain, this continue to push through, take a couple of insets before they go out on the playing field. It makes a lot of sense to me that that would increase their risk of a, of a poor prognosis. So I'm trying to convince you of, uh, of what Tim actually also tried to convince you of uh, earlier today, that it's not only in the healthy athletes, this is also in patients with metallophilic pain and all these other types of knee conditions associated with uh, with sports. I think that's why we need to be really good at talking and educating our patients about managing their workloads and both in sports but also in their everyday life. I think this is really, really essential. We actually try to do that. So now this is a brief walkthrough of some of the mistakes that uh, that we've done. We did a little trial on um, on kids with uh, total femoral pain between 15 and 19, where we compared like this educational package on how to manage your workloads, how to do something good for yourself for your knee pain. We compared it to the same educational package, but then we we added on exercises at uh, school premises to make it really, really easy for, uh, for these young kids to, after school was finished, they just walked straight over to another room at the school and took part in these um, 
exercise classes with a, with a physiotherapist. Back then I had a really, really strong belief in that exercises can cure everything in terms of, of knee pain. And we, uh, we supported this educational component with, with leaflets that tried to uh, duplicate what the physiotherapist told them during this 30 minute of education session so they could take it back home, hang it on their fridge and then continuously look at it and then hopefully change behaviors and reincorporate these <coughs> simple pictograms on this is the right way to go back into sport, this is the wrong way. Not too specific in, uh, in retrospect, but it's a way of supporting uh, self-management these uh, these kids. And we made a similar one for, for adults as well. So the supervised exercise program was pretty much based on what's been shown to be effective in the literature. So it consisted of supervised hip and knee exercise three times a week for three months and also some home-based exercise they should do on the days where they couldn't attend the, the supervised exercise classes. So a fairly simple standard program that you would also uh, use today. Different progressions models, so whenever they could do the first part well, they would progress to, <coughs> to more and more difficult exercise, both in terms of balance control, but also in terms of strength. And all the strength work was done at around 10 to 12 repetition maximum, and, in terms of really pushing them, always. So, um, I'll just jump straight to the main result because I think at that time they were a bit disappointing for me. So we followed up these two groups, either randomized to patient education or patient education combined with exercise therapy. So basically, a minimal cheap intervention versus a big, quite expensive intervention because this is supervised exercise therapy. We followed them up for two years and our main outcome, our main endpoint was here at 12 months where we could see that in the group who received the maximal intervention, 38% deemed themselves as recovered on this seven point scale and 29% in the group that received exercise or only patient education. So if you look at, at p-values and so on, those that received the big packets were more likely to be recovered after 12 months and also at the other time points. But taking statistics aside and so on, if you look at the difference between these two, it's minute. The number needed to treat was 11, meaning we had to give the new big intervention for 11 to have just one more recovered adolescent. That's not a, a sound effective intervention to be honest. So I was a bit disappointed back then. What we also saw was that we gave these advice on how to actually reduce the amount of sport and then slowly build up again. But what we saw was that basically none adhered to our advice, or only half adhered. And if they didn't adhere, they were actually in higher risk of still suffering from pain after three months. So this about not reducing how much you do was actually linked with poor prognosis in these, uh, in these kids. And then when we talked to some of these afterwards, talking about why did you really comply with our advice, they were like, it's hard to operationalize the advice you actually give. When you show me these pictograms, it's not really specific enough on how I can actually do it. So there are a lot of good inputs from the kids afterwards that if you want them to change behaviors, it needs to be specific, it needs to be easy to, uh, to comply with as one of the barriers. There's several other barriers, but this was one of the most important things, I think. So this is one point, maximal versus minimal intervention in these young kids with patellofemoral pain, minimal difference. But if we go into the adult literature, the adult patients with patellofemoral pain, we see exactly the same thing. These control interventions consisting of a bit of education, a leaflet on how to manage your own knee pain, compared to these maximal expensive interventions. These are actually two studies that are published in the British Medical Journal, some of the biggest, best trials within this area. Both concluding that exercise therapy is more effective than a control intervention, but if you look at the difference between the different uh, 
compared to the control. I think exercise therapy for managing patellofemoral pain have very, very little to, uh, to actually offer compared to the whole education side of things. So, um, and this is something new that I have incorporated into uh, because it just recently came out. It's a trial from one of my friends, uh, Jean Francois, JF, from, uh, from Canada, where he, among runners, so these are runners where there's been a current fad of running retraining to fix patellofemoral pain. And uh, what he did was randomize runners with patellofemoral pain, 69 of them, to either education and exercise therapy, or education and running retraining, the current fad, or he had the third group just receiving advice, the education side of things. And what he actually saw was that after 20 weeks, no difference between these three groups. The group that just got good advice on how to manage their running, so if you have pain, reduce a bit. If you're doing too much, then progress or reduce to 50% and slowly build up. And these simple, well-meaning advice, they did just as well as these big interventions with supervised exercise therapy and running retraining on how to change your cadence and improve your uh, quick zone of, uh, of cadence. And I think this just highlights that, or the point I'm trying to make is that we can get a far away by just talking, educating, giving them some, uh, some sound advice. And we, we wrote a, an editorial about it that came out uh, a couple of days ago where I think Patient education in patellofemoral pain, potentially important and essential, but under-researched. And I think this is the point you should take home with you, that sometimes we just need to do the simple stuff really, really good. I was just at a conference on low back pain in Oslo a week ago, and some of the things that I took from that is people have moved in the direction of more and more complex interventions for these musculoskeletal conditions. But what I think we should be doing is focusing on the basics, self-management, education, but do it really, really good. Not just think that it's a five minute talk about that yeah, we need to cut down a bit and build up again, but really making sure that our athletes, our patients know what we mean and we give them some tools so they can actually integrate it into their, their lives. So um, how can we apply this? How can we apply this, this concept of, uh, of education? We just finished a, a new trial where we actually tried to, uh, instead of focusing on all this supervised exercise therapy, we just focused on teaching these patients how to manage how much they do and gave them the tools to manage their own, uh, own eating. So despite this was done in a group of 151 kids between 10 and 14, I think the results you can also use across the board for adults as well because it's just it's just a simple way of getting them to take ownership and giving them some tools to, to self-manage their, their pain. So it was, um, it was based on these three different phases, basically. So in the early part, <clears throat> early part we, uh, we had them in with the physiotherapist, talked to them about activity modification. So we said, you have to cut down or stop with sports for four weeks. And then we put in some, some double limb bridge and some static holes, not to keep them totally away from sport because as Tim also mentioned, you should be really careful about stopping everything you do. And then in the, the second phase, we introduced this concept of, a, of an activity data, which I will show you in a, in a while, which was basically a simple progression model for going through from walking all the way back to sport, giving them some simple rules of <coughs> when can I actually progress. And we gave them a couple of simple hip and knee exercises they could uh, they could do at home. And then in this final period, we helped them with the return to sport after they reached this uh, sixth step on our activity ladder. And then we kind of tried to to tailor our education to the different phases. So in the beginning, we start about why did you get yourself in more pain local sport and also provide them with a rationale for why it's important that you follow this and why each of these different components make sense because if you suddenly have a patient that ah this is why i need to do x y and z then they're so much more likely to actually comply with what you say so getting the patient on board and
and in this case, also the parents, I think is, uh, is key. And then when we reach this second phase, we talk about how to make them their own coach, giving them some simple tools on how they could uh, monitor how much they do and progress from there. And then in, uh, in the last phase, we talk to them about how they can safely return into uh, to competition, <coughs> to competition and how to continue to actually monitor how much they're doing so they can become their own best coach was kind of the phrase we used to the kids and the and parents. Really, really simple. And um, we developed this, this leaflet again. In, it's in Danish, but it's basically you lose your knee pain. That was the, the title, and it was enforcing, like, we don't have the tools. We're just giving you the tools so you can self-manage your knee pain. And these are the specific things that we suggest you do because of X. Y and uh, and Z. So something about pain. How can you pain is okay, but too much pain might not be okay. We stole that from previous publications uh, by Karen as well and modified it a bit. And we um, had some simple exercises. Then we had this uh, activity ladder, which was basically saying, well, you start by step number one. And when you can do walking or bicycling within this okay zone of pain, then you progress to uh, to number two. Then when you three, you progress to number four when you could do it within the okay zone. Because this was based on input from the parents and also the kids, and now it's, it's somehow comprehensible when they can make the transition, when they can uh, increase their or progress their training loads. Or not training those, but only the different activities they can do. And then when they are down here, they start to do uh, competition again on their normal team sport, only participating in the warm up. And then for every week, they build up 15 minutes of, uh, of play time, which was a bit difficult in some team sports, but in general, it worked quite well with this slow introduction back into, uh, into sports. And um, it's not been published yet, so that's why it's. Um, it's a bit rough still, but we had these 151 with the majority were sports active. Some had already stopped sport because of, of knee pain, had pain for roughly 18 months, and one in every four regularly used uh, painkillers to, to self manage their, their knee pain. And we followed them up for four weeks until, uh, until 12 months. We just got the 12 months uh, result. And we used this uh, seven point uh, Likert scale, which we have used continuously in, in our own studies on the telephone pain. And if they said to the question, how is your knee pain now compared to before treatment? If they said much improved or improved success, but if they only said like slightly improved, the same all the way down, no success. So 12 weeks were our primary outcome, and we can see that. Here after 12 weeks, basically 85% of these kids are in the green is a success because they're much improved or improved and it seems to actually maintain. So even after the study stops here at 12 weeks, they still maintain this sense of being, uh, being recovered. And 75% uh, was already back playing, uh, playing sport after three months. The only difference from before is that they were back just didn't have knee pain while uh, or playing. So only 7% used painkillers at our follow-up, which was down from one in every every four, which I think is a strong message uh, as well. And 90% were satisfied, and then 95% would recommend it to uh, to a friend with uh, similar uh, similar types of, of knee pain. And if you just look at so we've done at least three trials now with these young kids with, uh, with pain. Two of them has been very focused on, you need to go to a health professional because they can then teach you to do the absolute best exercise, the supervised exercise therapy. And now shifting it around, the rethink, going to just delivering tools so they can self-manage we suddenly get 85% being recovered after three months. And this is the exact same outcomes, it's the exact same timing, and these two studies are pretty much on the same age group. So I think this is a, a strong message that it makes sense, and we have a health economist that is looking at the data now, and 
if you look at it from a, a cost perspective, this is by far the most cost effective intervention because basically it's much, much cheaper because it requires less consultations, but it's so much more effective on both clinical outcomes, strength improvements, back into sport, quality of, uh, quality of life. So my biased approach in, uh, in managing patients, athletes with uh, patellofemoral pain is that simple is sexy. We need to go do the, the basic things really, really well, but also take our time to do it really, really well. We need to make sure that we just don't feed them with information, but they actually comprehend and are able to use it into changed behaviors. This is so important. Load management and maybe a few simple exercises for, uh, for the majority. I don't think that exercises are always needed. If this is the recent onset of metallophemal pain, I would just do the simple thing, educating them, looking at their training load, getting to adjust a bit, then see how it goes. I wouldn't even add exercise in these uh, early phases. Don't overcomplicate it. And I think encouraging self-management is key because self-management if we teach them how to manage their own knee pain, well, if they have a new episode of knee pain a year later, they might think, well, I actually managed quite well last time. Maybe I'll just do this myself instead of thinking, I need to go to a health professional, I need to go to a physiotherapist to take my knee or show me the exercises or whatever. So create independence, teaching them how to self-manage, I think is extremely important also for long-term health. So sometimes less is more, don't be afraid to keep things simple. You don't have to give exercises every time. It's perfectly fine just sitting with the patient, making sure they understand the concept of acute to chronic load ratio, educating them on what they can do to manage their own, uh, own knee pain. So the rethink, to kind of tie it in with my time list, uh, for me what the rethink has been coming from this focus on supervised exercise being the keystone or cornerstone in managing patellar femoral pain, going to self-management, just teaching these both kids and adults with knee pain what they can do to, uh, to manage their own knee pain. And of course, this won't fix everything. I'm not trying to convince you of that, but just do the simple things first before you start to, uh, to add layers of complexity and also cost for the healthcare system and for uh, the patient as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael, for this wonderful presentation and for simplifying the message uh, for everybody. Um, we'll take uh, we have a few minutes, so we'll take questions from the audience. Christine. Yes. Um, thank you for a very nice talk, uh, Michael. It's so wonderful to hear from us. Uh, I'm a physical therapist by training and I've been working with uh, Olympic athletes and, uh, for many years. And, and I've seen to some degree that this works with them just by telling them how to work uh, simple and uh, low management as a point of piece. And I really appreciate that you're coming out with some very good signs showing that. It actually works. Um, I was thinking that actually when we talk about uh, intelligent neuropathy, there's a, actually a very nice study by Fatbear who did uh, a sort of a prevention study showing that actually if you have a change, a pathological change in the patellar tendon, then uh, so in that, that cohort uh, of people, uh, there were one, uh, I think they were randomized for doing uh, the Alfredson uh, uh, regime, and then there was some of them who uh, had uh, patella tendon, I think all the soccer players, uh, super in the best league in Denmark, and some of them were also normal. And there, uh, they thought uh, in, his, in his group of uh, Fred Bear that if you actually gave exercise for those who had changes in the patella, you, you would actually make it good. But it actually showed that it was the other way around by giving exercises that you actually did the worst, that you increased the risk of having patella tendinopathy uh, because they didn't have, uh, they only have the changes and not symptoms by the 
start this way. So it's more like a common, uh, I would say, uh, in the patellas in the not the area. But I think it, it's an analog to how we used uh, supervised exercises in the in the old RCT beginning because they continue to be at this level of sports participation. <coughs> Then we actually added on top of that, which might have been too much. Yeah. We just added more exercises on top. No, it makes sense that they didn't get uh, they didn't get better. So I think it ties yeah. nicely to what I'm saying there. Yeah. And especially in people and in persons who are doing a lot of exercise, and we as a therapist want to give them exercise of doing them good, but we actually doing them bad. I agree, but that's a, a big barrier of being um, courage enough to say. Exercise, not need we just sit here and talk, and I'll teach you how to manage. As Mark Twain said, to man, the hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, you know, it's all the similarities with what we're talking about from tendon injuries and things. So, my thought is that for the last study that you're doing, you might not be there yet, right? So, you're doing very well up to one year, but there, you still have that group that's not doing well. Yeah. When do you, when do you consider that it's time to go in and look at them and do something different. What do you think the timing is specifically for telephone patients? So it's, a, it's a good point. So this was a study that wanted to control things, but I would say three months is where I now see three months going through this because we know it's basically 85% is getting better. If you're not better after, then we start to add layers of, uh, of complexity. You might in some cases also consider imaging, but rarely imaging. Because those, because you saw the you saw the plateau basically, exactly. three months, and then you see the plateau. Is 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 the are those the same people that stay well, or are a lot of people flipping? So so this is uh, so we we collected the uh, actigraph data, which is a way to look at the physical activity levels and have a clever postdoc looking at it. At the moment, it appears that the fifteen percent that didn't do well was actually roughly those that didn't comply with anything. So they kind of pushed through because they had a Danish national championship and they didn't think they could reduce and then build up again. So um, so among the compliance, the success rate would be even, uh, even higher. Okay. I think just have a few seconds or a really quick question here as a practitioner. Uh, what do you think about uh, incorporating biopsychosocial model of pain? I mean, obviously, <clears throat> in terms of injuries and uh, relief and everything else, previous experiences, beliefs, thoughts can influence the rate of pain. So as a practitioner, how do you deal with that or and are you dealing with how with it? So, um, so in these kits with a quite recent onset, it's, it's a very simple thing. We had maybe 5 or 8 percent which uh, also said when we saw them that um, so I'm afraid of doing sports because pain equals structural damage. So I know that when I'm out playing sport, that will damage my knee long term. This is like an 11 or 12 year old that, uh, that tells me that. In these cases, it's part of the education side of things we do if we deem there's a necessity of going in and saying, challenging uh, those beliefs early on. But if we're talking about so the other patients I would see from the five-year follow-up, which comes in, might start with knee pain now, it's also back pain and shoulder pain. That's where we go in and spend much more time on beliefs, worries, what can you do to actually live and manage your pain instead of focusing only on the, the sports participation side of things. So these kids, I think it's, it's fairly simple. I think we have no idea what to do, but when it becomes more chronic, that's where I tend to spend more time on uh, other things than just the bio side of uh, things. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. We're going to have Michael give another talk on uh, Sunday uh, on the on the plantar uh, uh, So there will be opportunity for more questions then. So please join me in thanking uh, Michael uh, one last time for his presentation.